All right, so take your Bibles, and I hope you have one. If not, in your pew in front of you, I'm sure there is one. Uh, feel free to use it tonight. And we're going to look at two different passages. Turn first to Mark. Mark chapter 4. And I hope tonight that not only the adults in this room would be able to understand more about Christmas, but also uh, the kids, some of the elementary students. Uh, because I want to be, I want to really intentionally be able to ask the question, what does Christmas mean? What's Christmas all about? And we talked a little bit about that this morning, but as we head towards Christmas, we're going to ask this question. What is Christmas all about? Now, some of you kids know that we've entered into what we call the holiday season or the Christmas season. But I want especially our kids to understand that most of what we know about Christmas is not true. <laughs> In fact, we're going to talk about what Christmas really means. There are a lot of things, and I want to speak to the kids and students first. There's a lot of things that your parents and your grandparents, and many times even within the church, that we put an emphasis on that's really not even important. <laughs> in fact, many of the things we talk about in the biblical narrative surrounding Christmas is secondary. Now, what is important? What I want to speak about tonight, about Christmas, is probably not what you normally hear when we talk about Christmas. Now, let me ask this question before we go on and read Mark chapter 4. When you enter into this Christmas season, the holiday season, there are certain things that we enjoy about this time of year. How many of you guys enjoy the Christmas time? I mean, I do. There's, there's good memories that we've made with our families. How many of you guys enjoy the snow? I mean, I, I like the snow. I like to pull the kids around in the yard. We like the hot chocolate. We like the decorating. We even like talking about the manger scene. All, all those things are great. But all of those things are, again, secondary. So what is, kids, I want you to understand this. What is Christmas all about? You want to know what Christmas is all about? And this is probably something that you've never heard before. Christmas is about God's anger. You say, what? I've never heard that before. But how is Christmas about God's anger? We're going to talk about that tonight. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse number 35. The Bible says this, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, this is Jesus speaking to some people, he said, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. And the other boats were with him. Then the Bible says in verse number 37, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. So, what we have here is a scene in which Jesus is with his disciples and what's taking place is they're all on this boat and the wind starts blowing. And, and this isn't just a normal breeze. Like this is wind that would literally tear the sheathing off the side of your house. I mean, this is a this is strong storm that has come upon this boat. So much so that the, the storm was going to sink the boat here in Mark chapter 4. And these sailors were going to die. It was very evident from Mark chapter 4. But then, look at verse number 38. The Bible says, But he was in the stern. Some of you guys may have not been on a boat. You're not familiar with this. The stern is the back of the boat. The bow is the front. stern is in the back. It says, He, this is Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So here's Jesus. He's asleep on the boat. And then look at verse 39. And he awoke 
He rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now some of you guys have heard this story before. You've probably heard it in Sunday school. You've heard it taught along the way that, all right, Jesus calmed the storm. Well, at that point, most pastors began to apply this and say, Jesus has power over the storm. He has the power over the storms in your life. That's probably what you've heard from Mark chapter 4. But this passage is so much deeper than Jesus being more powerful than the storm. And we're going to see that. Look at verse 39 again. He awoke, he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace be still, the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So there's a storm. And this is a, the kind of storm even the best sailors could not, could not get through. The boat was going to sink. The boat, was, bo the boat, words are hard. The boat was beginning to fill with water. And everyone in this boat knew there's nothing that they could do to save themselves. They knew they were perishing. They knew that they were helpless. And so where's Jesus? What did the Bible say? He's asleep where? In the stern, right. So he's asleep on the cushion. He rises up. He rebukes the storm. And people teach that this story is about Jesus' power over nature. It does reveal Jesus' power over nature, but there is so much more. That's not the most important point of this story. Remember that story for a second. Remember the story of Jesus in the storm. Now I want you to turn in your Bibles to Jonah. You say, what does all this have to do with Christmas? I promise, if you track with me, you will see it. Turn to Jonah in the Old Testament. In Jonah chapter 1, I'll give you a second to, to turn there. We're introduced to a man named Jonah. Go figure. And the Bible says this, in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 3, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You see, God had already commissioned him to go preach in Nineveh. But where did he go? He went in the opposite direction. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So here's a man who's running from God. What he's doing, guys, is he's disobeying God. Now look at verse number 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. There's a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Let's stop there for a second. So, it's getting close to winter time. We might get snow at some point. Imagine taking a snowball, fashioning it, and then just throwing it as hard as you can. That's, that's what you need to picture as in hurling. The Bible here talks about the Lord fashioning a storm. And He's hurling it. The infinite, eternal God hurling a storm onto the sea. God did it. God caused it. And it was bad. <laughs> years and years ago, when I was a little boy, my dad decided that he would take me deep sea fishing. Never, I've never done that before. A boy from the mountains of North Carolina, you just don't go to the ocean very often. So here I am, and we take off, and we get about 30 miles offshore. You couldn't even see land. And then I just start seeing all of these uh, deck hands putting on rain gear. I'm like, it ain't going to rain. It's beautiful out here. Well, within 10 minutes, it was rough. And I was already scared because I'd never been out on the ocean like that. But then here comes a storm. Everything turns dark, and things just get crazy. I mean, when I say crazy, I mean, this boat, which had probably 50 people on it, looked like a little minnow out there. The waves would go up real high, and then there was these valleys. And I can remember the boat being down the valley and just looking up at these waves like, we're going to die. As a little boy, I literally felt helpless in the storm. Well, that's exactly what's going on here in Jonah chapter 1. This boat that we find here in Jonah chapter 1 was filled with some of the best sailors. But God made a storm, and he 
hurled it onto the sea. And then the sailors begin to question, what's going on here? Why is this happening to us? In fact, look at verse number 8 of Jonah chapter 1. The Bible says, Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Where do they find Jonah at? Look at verse 6. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God, perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. So here is Jonah asleep in the boat. Did we not just read a story in Mark chapter 4 of someone asleep on the boat in the middle of the storm? We did. So here we have two sleepers, Jesus and Jonah. Now, the solution in Jonah's story was for him to be thrown into the sea. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them, then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempest. They picked Jonah up because he told them to. And where did they throw Jonah? Into the sea. Look at verse 12. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. The sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. So let's review for a second for those that are scratching their heads. Remember, God made a storm. He hurled it onto the sea. The boat is breaking apart and nobody can save themselves. Now here's where we connect the dots. This storm here in Jonah chapter 1 was directly related to God's anger. God was angry at the rebellion of Jonah. Now, why was God angry? I'll just answer that question, right? Because of Jonah's sin. God hates sin. Why? Because he is good. Because he is a good God, he hates sin. And because of our sin, there is a raging storm of God's wrath. In Jonah's situation, the storm that he was experiencing was directly related to his sin. God hates sin. Because of sin, because of sin there's a raging storm. And there's nothing, like these sailors, there's nothing that we can do to stop that raging storm of God's wrath against us. So, in Jonah... The solution was for Jonah to be taken as this rebellious sinner and thrown into the midst of God's wrath, into the ocean. What happened when that took place? What happened when Jonah hit the water? The storm stopped. You're exactly right. Jonah was a guilty man. He was thrown into the middle of God's wrath. The storm stopped. What about the story of Mark chapter 4? What happened? You see, Jesus was not a guilty man. He had nothing to fear. You notice in all the chaos, he was completely calm there in Mark chapter 4. Jesus never sinned, but here's the spiritual connection here. But in order to stop the storm of God's wrath coming against us, what did he do? Nobody had to throw Jesus into the sea. What did he do? He willingly jumped into the sea of God's wrath. He threw himself in. I'm about to connect this for the kids here in just a second, but track with me. Every single one of us, within the sound of my voice, are in the same boat. We'll call it the USS Raymond. That's pretty clever, right? But we are all in the same boat. We are in a bad storm caused by our sin and our rebellion. The boat's breaking apart. The waves are very high. But where is Jesus? He's asleep. Because, again, 
He's done nothing wrong. He has never done anything wrong. The wrath of God surrounds you and I. Our boat is breaking apart. We deserve to die. We literally, like Jonah, deserve to be swallowed up by the ocean. But what Jesus has done is he has come at that exact moment that we are about to die. And what does he do? He throws himself into that ocean, even though he didn't deserve to die. He paid for our sins with his life. And then God's anger was calmed. And now God can freely love us. That's pretty, pretty wild, right? This huge storm of God's wrath that we deserve to die in, Christ willingly took the wrath of God. Somebody had to. Let me say this before we move on. When you see someone who loves you enough to come, we talked about this this morning, Philippians 2, to leave the splendor of heaven with all the divine privileges and empty himself of his divine privileges, not his divine nature, and to give himself for someone completely unworthy, that should cultivate in our life thankfulness and gratitude. Kids, what you need to understand is this. When it comes to the Christmas season, our desires and our affections need to be set on the one who loves us very much, and that's Christ. That he would willingly give his life for us. He jumped into the, into the sea so we would not die spiritually. If someone gave their life for you, are you going to stop thinking about that person? No. Then why at Christmas do we allow other things to consume our mind? Should we not love that person? I mean, Jesus is more important than anything else. Many times whenever it comes to Christmas, we begin talking about the star, the wise man, and all of these things. But I want to remind you again tonight, one of the, something that we should focus on in Christmas, which we do not, is God's wrath. Do you understand, just in between the services today, from the morning service till tonight, there is enough accumulated sin in my life to send me to hell. Like, we need to understand that Christmas is about God's provision for our sin, for granting us salvation. He threw himself into the sea, stopped the wrath of God that was coming against me and you. So, what is Christmas about? Yes, it's about a baby in a manger. It's about the God-man who would grow up living a sinless life and go to the cross and die in our place. But it's also about the great king who threw himself into the sea, even though he didn't deserve it, in order to save the people in the boat. The great king jumped in to save the people in the boat. I'll share a story with you right quick. Again, tonight was supposed to be tree decorating, but I couldn't just decorate a tree. I want us to, our attention and our affections to be drawn back to Christ. There is a story, and it's a pretty familiar story, maybe you've heard it before, uh, about this particular king. It was a Russian king who entered into a dog sled race, him and his servant. So here's this Russian king and his servant, which sounds pretty manly, right? I've never done a dog sled, but it'd be fun. Uh, so here he is. He's riding the dog sled. They enter into this huge race uh, through the wilderness of Russia. And as they're going along, what begins to surround them is a big pack of wolves. Now, kids, what you have to understand is wolves are not like dogs. And wolves are not even like coyotes. Like the head on a wolf is huge. So as they're going along behind this dog sled in the middle of this race, they begin to understand, hey, there's no way out of this. There's no way we can save ourselves. 
So as they're going along, the wolves are approaching closer and closer. What this servant does is he jumps off the dog sled, and the wolves begin to eat his body. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. But anyways, he saves the king from, from death. Now, I've heard people use this illustration in sermons to say, well, that's what happened with the gospel. That's what happened with Christ. And to that I say, no, it's not. In that story, the servant jumped off in order to save the life of the king. But in the gospel message, if we were going to use this illustration, it would be the king jumping off and dying in order to save the servant. That's what Christmas is about. The king left the splendor of heaven in order to save pitiful servants like you and I. All right. So if if we were to summarize tonight and allow the rubber to meet the road, this is what I would say to you. As you begin preparing your heart for Advent, as we continue to do that, as you continue to think about Christmas and lead your family well, just push through all the fluff. Push through the... I've I, I got to be careful here because this is... It burns me up how we're completely missing the point of Christmas. Your loyalty during the Christmas season belongs to one person, and that is Christ. So as you move forward, begin to ask the question, is there, am, I, am I wasting my time on fluff and religion, or am I focusing my attention upon loyalty to Christ? Right, let me pray for us, and then I'll explain the rest. Lord, I pray that you would use your word during this season and your spirit to deepen our intimacy with you. Help us to grow in our knowledge of you in order that we would worship you and desire to serve you more. Lord, I pray that these folks that showed up tonight would trust and, and even experience that you are so much greater than the trivial things that are surrounded by our contemporary American Christmas culture. Lord, please move our hearts in that direction. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.